Love it or leave it. Let's get into it. What a week. For months now, Ron DeSantis has been stepping in it. What has been the main challenge because the former president, Donald Trump, still remains so dominant? One ex staffer saying, quote, he would sit in meetings and eat in front of people, always like a starving animal who has never eaten before, getting stuff everywhere. Are you going? What's your name? I'm Tim Anthony. Okay. And I will not let you down. But increasingly, the question has become, as he's stepping in, it, what is he stepping on? As we can see here, internet sleuths, the coolest and best and most accurate people, have observed some unusual activity, specifically DeSantis' strange gait and stance. There's also the fact that his legs seem to be strangely proportioned. So this is a photo for those listening. Someone noted that if you look at the way his legs are when he was on Bill Maher, that like the only way to make sense of it is to assume he's standing on his tippy toes inside of his little boots. But then there's also the fact that the front of his cute little boots look like there aren't any toesies in there. Well, Ron DeSantis can run like a dinosaur, <laughs> but he can't hide from accountability. During an appearance on the right-wing Patrick Bet Davis podcast, Ron DeSantis Weird finally was asked about this mystery, this shoe done it. And he kicked these rumors to the curb. Ron vehemently denies wearing hidden heels in his cowboy boots. Why don't you wear tennis shoes and dress shoes? Uh, I do wear tennis shoes when I work out, yeah. You do? Okay. Besides, they aren't heels. There are these new things. They're called tough guy foot horses. (laughs) But this intrepid interviewer, who we like during this moment, but should probably not listen to even five more seconds of... (laughs) God help us if we heard ever again in our lives even five more seconds... But this guy went on, he continued. What they're trying to say with this is that in your boots, you have heels. No, 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 That's yeah, what they're no, those, to say. those are just standard off the rack, um, Lucchese. Um, how, uh, Lucchese how, tall you, how tall are you going? How tall 5'11". Are you? 5'11", okay. He's asking, this is, what a fucking humiliation. I mean, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get over it. Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSantis, who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? A woman who I tricked into helping me move a sofa into a van. Uh, but, but Bette Davis wasn't done being Ron's Bette Noir. I got a gift for you. I'd love for you to wear, okay, I shop at Ferragamo, okay, and I got... I don't accept gifts. I can't accept I, it. I told you. I'm sorry. First of all, (laughs) DeSantis' face, he's so, I I have to say, it's like, you kind of feel for DeSantis a little bit because he's so hapless, he is so, he has no aptitude for kind of the like, the interchange, he has no ability to take in this, look, Ron DeSantis is a five foot eight freak. (laughs) Trying to be five foot 11, that is the truth, obviously. We all know that, that is so clear. He is by, there are certain people that demand to be bullied, right? Like, (laughs) Like, there's something about his, and by the way, like I've had guests on Love It or Leave It, and there's just something that comes over me, and I won't say who they are and you'll never know. But there's just something that comes over me, and it's just like, I want to bully this person. I want to give them a swirly. I want to make them pay. For what? I don't know. I don't know. But like, Ron DeSantis has that energy. He invites bully. He is a bully. He is, there's, Trump is a bully who doesn't invite bullying from across the table. 
that he has a strength. He does. He has a kind of charisma and power. I deal with it. I look. Oh, what? what yeah, I don't. Uh, sorry. Let me back up. Not a fucking fan. We can't have a. You don't want to have an honest conversation about his strengths. When you want to do that? December. After he wins? No, we have to do it fucking now. We have to do it now. So anyway, Donald Trump has a strength. He does. He does. That is his, he has, he, has a, he has a charisma. He's a bully you root for. DeSantis is a bully you root against. And that is what led to this moment. And then you see on DeSantis' face that kind of tight fucking smile when he's getting the booze. And he doesn't know how to be fun. So he's like, I can't accept gifts. And it's like, this wasn't on the paperwork. You have to file a form if you'd like to give me shoes. <laughs> so anyway, this fucking Jagoff, <laughs> who we hopefully will never see again, presents DeSantis with these fucking shoes. And DeSantis says, I can't accept gifts. And then... Yoink, Senator Bob Menendez pops into frame to grab, <laughs> to grab the shoes. Damn it, I was gonna do a yoink, said Clarence Thomas. <laughs> but how can we know for sure? That's right, we're gonna spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> how do we know for sure DeSantis doesn't just naturally clump around like an uncertain newborn cult? How do we know that his natural gait isn't 12-year-old bat mitzvah girl who talked her mother into letting her wear heels for the first time? <laughs> well, in the wake of this controversy, Politico spoke to three shoemakers. One said, I, really? <laughs> and they say journalism is dead. <laughs> Hard disagree. Politico spoke to three shoemakers. One said, I've dealt with these politicians many times. I've helped them with their lifts. DeSantis is wearing lifts, there is no doubt. And another thing, said the shoemakers, you guys only ever ask us about shoes, but we have some thoughts on abortion. Hey, turn that tape recorder back on. Anyway, according to these experts, the key giveaways are shorter heels on DeSantis' boots, which would be cut down to accommodate the lifts, and then the openings at the top of his boots, which are wider than usual, suggesting he's sized up to make room for the wedges. Interesting, right? That's why when you look at his, like, if you look here, like, they go wide at the top. They're not snug, because he's got to get, there's so much more foot <laughs> where ankle is supposed to be. In conclusion, <laughs> it was obvious he was wearing heels. I mean, have you seen that ass? <laughs> Awooga! Ron DeSantis, John DeLikey. Ultimately, it's sad, these female beauty standards. Ron DeSantis has to do everything Trump does, but backwards in high heels. <laughs> Speaking of liars in heels, a House resolution to expel George Santos from Congress <laughs> failed spectacularly on Wednesday. It would take two-thirds to remove Santos, but they didn't even have a majority. This is just like the time they tried to kick me off the Lakers, said George Santos. <laughs> After the vote, Santos tweeted, tonight was a victory for due process, not me. This was never about me. <laughs> there is no sentence that self-refutes. Harder than, this isn't about me. He said, I'll never let it become about me. We all have rights under this great constitutional republic and I'll fight for our right to uphold them till my last dying breath. That post included a graphic of Santos wearing a crown <laughs> with the text, if you come for me, you best not miss. Santos then posted a photo of himself giving a thumbs up from the Mir space station. <laughs> Weird thing. It fell into the atmosphere a long time ago. 
While speaking in Minnesota on Wednesday, President Biden was interrupted by a crying baby to which, president to which the president responded this. It's okay. Kids are allowed to do that with me. Okay? Don't worry about it, all right? I don't blame him. Is it him or her? But before the mother could answer, Biden said, Wrong! And you failed my test, <laughs> said President Biden, smashing his fist down on the podium, getting younger and younger in real time. They are a beautiful and perfect baby child who shall tell us their gender in due time, if they tell us at all, as his hair thickened and darkened and his skin tightened. And he continued, soon we will see how foolish we've been, how lost we were in identity like epicycles on an unmoving earth, but we and the earth spin, and it's glorious. Tear down the interstates. Tear down what binds you to a hollow life. Let the horror enthrall and change you. By this point, Biden seemed to be maybe 25 years old. <laughs> so much abundance, so much creativity, and children starving, and animals suffering, and walls around every country and every heart. A vengeful God gave us dominion, and we will be punished in this life or the next. You let that baby scream. <laughs> At this point, Biden's voice cracked like a teenager, and he began to shrink. Why aren't we screaming, said a gawky Biden, barely able to see over the podium. This life is a miracle, he said finally, over and over again, toe-headed and childlike, shrinking until he disappeared into his suit only for the Secret Service to find a baby wailing underneath a pile of fabric. In the crowd, a naked 81-year-old Joe Biden stood up from on top of a shattered pram on which he found himself. The audience, in total silence, watched as he walked up four stairs to the stage, gathered up the crying baby from underneath his old man clothes, wrapped him in a shirt, and walked him down to the mother, who stood frozen, holding a blanket and bottle. I love you, Mom, he said, kissing her on the cheek, easing the child back into her arms. We love you. Then Biden tripped going back up to the stage, and of course, that's what they show on Fox News. I want you to know something. I want you all to know something. No one believed in that. No one believed in that. I wrote that on the plane. <laughs> and I sent it. And I sent it to the best team in podcasting. And they responded, someone check if he has a fever. And then they said, should we play crickets after? <laughs> play the sound you had ready in case that bombed. You didn't even have the fucking sound. <laughs> that, was that it? Play it again. That's what they wanted to play, because they thought that wasn't going to work. Let that be a lesson. This isn't about me. Republican, that is fucking insane. I do look hot, thank you. I'm just a hard work and discipline. You go to the, you go to the pharmacy and they give you this package. You gotta keep it cold. It's filled with hard work and discipline. Then you put it in your fridge and once a week you just put the discipline in a different part of your stomach. You gotta rotate. You gotta rotate or it doesn't work. It's experimental pancreas medicine. What could go wrong? Yes, yes, doctor. The experimental pancreas medicine. <laughs> Republican Ken Buck announced he would resign after his current term, telling the New York Times that the Republican Party has lost its way over Trump-driven election denialism. In other words, 
the buck stops here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> he said, we have an identity crisis in the Republican Party. If we can't address the election denier issue, we won't have credibility with the American people that we are going to solve problems. But then, if that's what you felt, and if you knew you were going to resign, and you were going to resign over Republicans denying the result of the election, why were you one of the eight people who voted to oust McCarthy, and then one of the people that voted to put election denier Mike Johnson in the speakership? What kind of fucking move is that? You're going to quit, so you did this for no fucking reason? You replaced, you replaced a, a guy that pretended to be an election denier for the fucking, for the fucking power? You decided we better to have a real one who believes it in his bones? Why is that better? Why, is that, why are you leaving us with this fucking guy? It's not even a joke. Like, what? <laughs> so you believe that, that the Republican Party shouldn't be an election-denying party. So you decided you wanted to swap out Kevin McCarthy for one of the guys that like rallied everybody behind doing the election denial, and then you quit. Like, this isn't a wedding where if you leave early, your aunt will tell the bride that you left before the cake was cut because she has a small and empty life. You don't need to create a diversion. You know what I mean? You got one of those aunts? When I was a kid, it we didn't know this for a very long time, but at my mother's wedding, my great-grandmother from my mother's side and my grandmother from my father's side exchanged phone numbers and kept tabs on their sides of the family, like a little fucking, like a spy organization for decades. And we only found out because someone had told great-grandmother Ruthie that there was a surprise party for my father that she wasn't invited to because nobody felt like driving all the way to Far Rockaway because then you'd have to drive for an hour and a half with her in the car. And she was an asshole. <laughs> and they thought, well, she doesn't know what's happening. It's a victimless crime. <laughs> but then she called her daughter and said, when are you picking me up for Robert's surprise party? And then that woman, my great aunt, called my mother and said, who fucking squealed? <laughs> It wasn't me. Somebody told her. We had to run a little counter intel up. <laughs> Turned out it was Bessie and Roslyn. <laughs> that's what happened. And that's a story about what happens to two brilliant women who didn't get to go to college. <laughs> they got all fucked up. <laughs> what? Why do you think they were like that? Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of Mike Johnson, <laughs> the more we learn about the new Speaker of the House, a guy who definitely thinks ketchup is spicy, <laughs> the less it makes sense. According to a report in the Daily Beast, Mike Johnson's disclosure forms list no bank accounts. Wait, yes. So according to this report, that would mean that the Speaker of the House does not personally have any accounts with more than $1,000, and they have no accounts owned by him or his wife together that add up to more than $5,000. <laughs> Say no more, brother, said New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez, <laughs> tapping his forehead knowingly with a stack of unmarked bills. Now, other conservatives rushed to Mike Johnson's defense, saying, actually, Mike Johnson's lack of a disclosed asset makes him downright American. Fox News ran with the headline, claim Speaker Johnson lives paycheck to paycheck makes him relatable. <laughs> Say defenders. Corrupt politicians hiding their wealth in secret offshore bank accounts, they're just like us. 
Now, what's beautiful about GOP populism is that a tacky billionaire who has a gold-plated apartment while also saying racist stuff is relatable, but so is a longtime lawyer somehow appearing to be broke. They can't lose. So Matt Gates then tweets, the Daily Beast is furious that Speaker Johnson isn't rich, corrupt, or rich from being corrupt. He doesn't have shady business deals. He doesn't trade stocks as a congressman. No. Fuck you. You cannot single mom who works too hard, who loves her kids and never stops, Mike Johnson. He does not have a gentle hand and heart of a fighter. He's not a survivor. You cannot fucking Reba this guy. But I will say, even though his financial disclosures make no sense, he does have the vibe of someone who makes his wife buy buttery rounds instead of brand name Ritz crackers because Jesus might see. Also, who says no to a buttery round? <laughs> and the cracker's not bad either. <laughs> Stop it. it. Doesn't even mean anything. Now, Republicans all got on their highest of high horses saying, my God, they're attacking Mike Johnson for, for living paycheck to paycheck, for taking care of his family like a lot of Americans do without being able to afford the nicer things. But the fact that Mike Johnson doesn't list any bank accounts is weird. The Daily Beast simply reported that this is surprising. And then these Republicans, one after another, read the report as nefarious. But why do they read the report as nefarious? Because they also think it's weird and surprising. <laughs> because they projected onto it what they thought when they saw it, which is, what's fishy? <laughs> because it makes no sense. As many have pointed out, Johnson has four children, a mortgage, and a line of credit, and has been earning over $200,000 a year because you add what he makes teaching online courses at Liberty University, which is real, plus his congressional salary, plus his wife's undisclosed income from two jobs. Now, that would suggest having a bank account with $1,000 in it. Like, that's not like, oh, what are you, fucking Queen of England? You have a bank account with $1,000 in it? No, he's a fucking lawyer, makes 174 grand a year for the Congress. He's got a bank account with $1,000 in it. Where do the direct deposits go? <laughs> to a GoFundMe for a Christian baker trying to develop a graham cracker that actually stops masturbation? Because <laughs> I've been eating these things for years, they don't work. This is Noah's Ark math. When the truth comes out, you know it's going to be some very unsexy reason, like his pastor tricked him into signing over his income so his church could buy the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a, this just in. It's a false alarm. It says here Mike Johnson just bought one big thing of blueberries that wasn't on sale. <laughs> I can't. At a campaign event on Wednesday, President Biden called for a humanitarian pause in the Israel-Hamas war to allow time to get hostages out. Look, just call it a ceasefire. A humanitarian pause is what should happen during Killers of the Flower Moon to let people go to the bathroom. <laughs> this Wednesday, teachers across this fair city of Portland walked out after months of bargaining, the union, which represents some, um, some 4,000 educators in the area, is asking for a pay increase to keep up with the cost of living, as well as smaller classes, more time to plan lessons, and support for kids who came back to the classroom post-COVID with more mental health needs. They're also asking that every teacher get residuals for digital streams of USA Network suits. <laughs> uh, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> now, teachers, I don't know how many, how many teachers we have here tonight. Nice. I don't know how much this applies to you, but over in Hollywood, we made a lot of progress by yelling at Drew Barrymore. <laughs> Here to tell us all about how you can help Portland's teachers, it's Portland area teacher Tiffany Koyama Lane. Hi, come stand with me. Hi. Come over. It's, We're going to just stand and talk to it, the people. Is it disrespectful to stand on your monologue no. papers? Okay. No, this is just garbage now. Okay. All right, now first, how long have you been teaching Portland's future freaks? 
I have been teaching for 15 years. 15 years. And I've been <laughs> teaching in Portland for 12 of those 12. years. The last 12. Yeah. Now, this is the first time in the district's history that a strike has been called, and it was called with 99% support. Why did a strike... <laughs> why did a strike become necessary? Well, we are seeing more urgent and unmet needs from our communities and from our students more than ever. Um, and we are unwilling to go back to the way things were before COVID, and we are ready to stand up for our kids and fight for what they deserve. How fucked up did these kids come back after COVID? It's, it's been rough. I mean, a public school classroom really is a mirror for what's going on in the larger society, in the city. All the teachers here know that. Um, you very quickly, right? Yeah, you see who has access to food, shelter, clothing, transportation, mental health supports. Um, yeah, we need to center our students. Right now is the time. This is a really important moment. And I am so proud that 99% of us are voted yes. That's incredible. How much did, speaking of sort of, the, speaking of the classroom as a microcosm, how much does social media make your job harder? And how much day to day does it make you worry about its effect on kids? Oh. I mean, I teach third grade. Um, <laughs> And so I, I do, and I have a first grader and a second grader myself who are in schools, in Portland Public Schools. Um, and I do see parents really starting to ask questions and feel scared about, you know, what, what can we do? Um, I see, I have encouraged them that really it's an organizing opportunity and that you have to get their peers to also, their, the parents of their peers to also be on the same page. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, once they get to middle school and high school and um, they're all using smartphones to connect with each other. Yeah, this is like totally different than what, <laughs> where I thought this was gonna go. Um, <laughs> uh, this is just my own personal. That's great. Yeah, but I, I tell families to just really start having those conversations now, how important it is to wait until Eighth grade, if possible, there's a campaign called Wait for Eighth that you can look up um, and just giving kids more time to be kids. What would you tell parents who may be frustrated that their kids didn't get to go to school today? Yeah, I, what I will say is we are so united right now. I am going to a lot of different schools. Um, I, so I'm a zone captain, so I support 12 different schools in Southeast Portland. Um, and we have the Portland community and the, the teachers, our union are so united right now. So if you go to any school site, you will see like parents are bringing banana bread and have their own signs because they trust the people that spend all day with their kids. They want, they want money to be going to student-facing supports. I don't know if you saw that there was a letter from the Oregon Legislative Assembly mm -hmm. today um, that really is, is urging the Portland Public Schools School Board to get to the bargaining table because they are concerned that 6% um, of the budget is spent on management where if you look at comparable districts, um, the average is more two to three percent. Wow. Yeah. Because the, part of this fight, right, is that the district is saying, oh, we can't give you what you want in terms of cost of living increases, uh, more teachers, smaller classrooms. Without, no rats in the classroom. No rats in the classroom. No we heard about, we were talking to a, guy, a school counselor today. We're not saying guidance counselor anymore. <laughs> we're saying school counselor. I learned that today. That, that when she came back to her desk after the summer, there was like mouse droppings all around her office. But the district is saying, oh, there's just not enough money to take care of all of this without making draconian cuts elsewhere. Right. But it sounds like what you're saying is there is- That's a lie. That sounds like it's a, a yeah. lot, what, what people would call a lie. Yeah. But, 
but basically, there's money if you take if you take the money from what isn't going to kids or isn't in front of in the classroom directly. Mm -hmm. Because when there are certain priorities, there's money, and then when it's time to invest in our kids, all of a sudden they they can't find the money, so they need to find the money, and there are a lot of people that signed on to that letter that said they need to get serious about that. <laughs> how can how can uh, the people in this room and how can listeners support the, the union in the fight right now? You can support our community in fighting for our students right now. I'm glad you asked that. You can take out your phone. Take, take out, your, out phone. your fucking phone. Take out your phone. <laughs> And text the word solidarity to 48744. Te <laughs> text the word solidarity, S O L I D A R I T Y. Nice. To 48744. I wrote it here just because I was like, I'm not going to get that wrong. I need to, Hell yeah. <laughs> if I'm asked that question. <laughs> Is everybody doing it? I see faces lighting up. I Who see did faces. it? Let me hear. Yeah. Who did it? Woo! Oh, I see all those phones. Thank you. Now, let's say this crowd was out of control and you needed to treat them like a group of delightful but horrible eight-year-olds. Oh, there are no horrible eight-year-olds. All right, well... <laughs> Now I'm questioning on some of the other things you said. <laughs> You're talking to Teacher Tiffany here, so... Well, as Teacher Tiffany, yeah. how would you scold, in a loving way, this group of people, if I need to, once you're gone? Like, if you okay. needed to get control of this room, yeah. what would you do? I will, sh I will show you. So, guys, you. make some noise like you're... Now... If you can hear my voice, clap once. If you can hear my voice, clap twice. If you can hear my voice, show me a peace sign. If you can hear my voice, show me a thumbs up. If you can hear my voice, put your eyes up here. Teacher Tiffany, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Support the Portland Public Schools. Come on. New York City officials have announced a new health campaign, Healthy NYC, aimed at raising the city's average lifespan to at least 83 years. Oh, leave me alone, said Rudy Giuliani, waking up with his face resting on a half-eaten cake at his dining room table that has one chair. <laughs> See where you're going with him? Now he's just, now, you know what? Now he's in his junior soprano, late sopranos era. You know what I mean? He's no longer, he's no longer in cahoots with Tony's mom trying to put the kibosh on his nephew. Now he's just an old, sad guy in a room. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the initiative is in response to the city's average life expectancy, which has fallen by two years. Hey, we're dying prematurely here. <laughs> TJ Holmes and Amy Robach, the Good Morning America hosts who were both married to other people, clearly having an affair, then kicked off the show, even though ABC said it wasn't against the rules, but just kind of weird, no distraction. Then both leave, left ABC, then both got divorced, have launched a podcast called Amy and TJ. But if you're listening at the office, make sure you wear headphones. They do like 15 minutes on Taylor and Kelsey, and the rest of it is just sex. Four men in Philadelphia face federal charges after allegedly robbing a truck from the U.S. Mint of over $200,000 worth of dimes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Quick, how many dimes? Two million. Too slow. Too slow. Too fucking slow. Let's get Teacher Tiffany back out here. The, 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 they were arrested after depositing thousands of dimes in local Coinstar machines. <laughs> First of all, you go through the elaborate task of robbing a U.S. Mint truck, and the second part of your plan 
is Coinstar? <laughs> this is what happens when you let the dumb one in the crew have an equal role. <laughs> Imagine doing a heist and turning around and giving 11.9% to fucking Coinstar. <laughs> Coinstar, they're the bandits. They're the fucking thieves. Coinstar. How do they get away with it? You sit, you get those fucking rolls, you get it done. You, you open up the big thing with all the change from pockets when that was a thing, when every day you came home with change. I feel a hundred years old. It's, a, it's another time, but you came home every day with change and it went into one thing. And then once a year, you opened that thing, and you sat down, and if you were fancy, you had one of those little machines. Remember those machines? You remember those fucking, remember those fucking machines? Did those machines work? No. <laughs> they did not work. <laughs> they didn't work at all. Some of the machines said, we know the difference between coins. That was a lie. <laughs> but even once they failed that task, the next task of neatly putting him in their sheath, <laughs> also unable to help. <laughs> so eventually, you sat, and you counted, and you made piles. And it was awesome. <laughs> it was truly an incredible amount of fun. Do you remember making the piles? And then you wondered, why does the bank trust me? <laughs> why, why is this the process? <laughs> According to a Washington Post report, homeschooling has become the fastest growing type of schooling in the US in recent years, even though it remains pretty much unregulated. Shut up, said a 14-year-old girl speaking in perfect Aramaic who can only count to eight. A woman who experienced months of diarrhea may have caught a bacterial germ from her newly adopted cat in a possible medical first. Doctors say you can reduce your risk of contracting the disease by making sure you and your cat use different litter boxes. <laughs> anyway, get well soon, Hallie and her cat, Hallie Jr. <laughs> Jesus. Look at that cat. The fuck is that? <laughs> and finally, <laughs> a new study in the journal Nature Geoscience suggests that a giant plume of dust from an asteroid is what killed the dinosaurs. But that's just easier for the families to hear than autoerotic asphyxiation. 